Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, it is a pleasure to see all of you here. I'm, the, I'm Ahmad, the president of the LSCSU Persian Society. Our panel will be discussing the impact of maximum pressure sanctions on Iran. Uh, the event will be chaired by our very own Dr. Courtney Freer from the LSE Middle East Center. Uh, she completed her doctorate at the University of Oxford, and she is a research fellow at the center. Hello. Hi. Um, thanks for joining us this evening to talk about uh, the effects of the maximum pressure sanctions on Iran. Um, I think it's a really timely discussion given that maximum pressure almost turned to military pressure uh, apparently last night. Um, and so I think uh, we're seeing kind of this unraveling of the relationship uh, since the cancellation of the nuclear deal, of course, uh, last year. So we have with us three speakers who are going to be speaking for about 15 to 20 minutes uh, on a three kind of different topics and then we'll open it up to um, questions and answers. So um, Tassan Akimian is the director of the London Middle East Institute and a reader in economics at SOAS. He's published widely on Middle Eastern econo economies, specializing on labor markets, inclusive growth, and the economies of Arab uprisings. Dr. Han Kimian is a founding member and until recently was the president of the International Iranian Economic Association and a research fellow and member of the advisory committee of the Economic Research Forum in Cairo. He's also the founder and series editor for the Rutledge Political Economy of the Middle East and North Africa series, which he launched in 2003. Uh, and he's going to be talking about sanctions, kind of the history of sanctions and how they're used as kind of potentially as weapons of mass destruction themselves. Um, we also have Kamiar Mohandas, who is a Janeway Fellow in Economics at the University of Cambridge and a senior lecturer and fellow in economics at Girton College um, in, at Cambridge. He's a research fellow at the Economic Research Forum and serves as its thematic co-leader for the macroeconomics theme. His main areas of research are macroeconomics, global and national macroeconometric modeling, um, clearly something I know nothing about, um, and energy economics. His articles have been published in a number of edited volumes uh, as well as in leading journals. His research has also been covered in major international news outlets, including Bloomberg, The Economist, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, um, and he holds a PhD in econom economics uh, from Cambridge. Isfandiar uh, Batmangalaj is the founder of the Borsan Bazaar, a media company which supports business diplomacy between Europe and Iran um, through publishing, yes, yeah, research uh, <laughs> and international events. He's the organizer of the Iran, uh, Europe Iran Forum, the leading, which is the leading international business conference on Iran. Um, and so he wants me to stop, so I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to these three because they're far more um, suited to talk about this topic than I am. So I think uh, Dr. Hakimian is going to start. Can you all hear me? Right. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, on a Friday evening on the longest day of the year. For me, it's a great pleasure to be back in LSE. A long time ago, I was a student here. I did my undergraduate. Uh, you don't want to work out my age, but it was in the 1970s. <laughs> and this building didn't exist, by the way. Uh, the former uh, Russian president, uh, Boris Yeltsin, was once asked to describe the state of Russian economy in one word and in his usual bombastic style, he banged the table and said, good. They said, could you elaborate? He said, not good. <laughs> so if you want to know about the state of Iranian economy, uh, it depends on how many words you give me. But that's not quite the focus of my opening uh, presentation, uh, although what I will be looking at uh, would lead on to the follow-up uh, presentations by um, Kamyar and Yar. And between the three of us, we hope to give you a more holistic analysis of the current situation. Um, Courtney mentioned the tense state of affairs in our region and a rather fluid and very dangerous uh, situation. We're going almost from day to day. Um, and I'm sure you've been following the news. Um, this is very interesting because in international relations, normally when we talk about conflict, we tend to look at or focus on the two ends of this, the extreme, war and peace. But we now know from a historical practice that there's another uh, state of affairs, and that is economic sanctions, which fits in between the two extremes, but potentially can be just as uh, destructive. And hence my rather provocative uh, title, uh, 
economic sanctions, foreign policy tool, or weapons of mass destruction. It's very important for us at the outset to remind ourselves how we've got to this very dangerous, if not precarious, situation. Uh, you will remember uh, 8th of May in 2018, uh, the USA uh, under Trump withdrew, uh, and I put the word withdrew in inverted commas from an international agreement to which Iran had signed with the P plus, uh, P5 plus one countries. Uh, now recently Iran has uh, threatened to breach its uh, obligations under the JCPOA. What's very interesting is the asymmetric terminology that used to describe the two obligations. Trump withdrew, Iran breaches. Well, I would like to uh, remind us that actually the first breach came with the executive order in front of world cameras with a lot of glee and uh, pride that uh, President Trump showed in front of uh, uh, an, a world audience uh, abrogating yet another international agreement to which by all accounts Iran was complying. So this was an open invitation, uh, if not goading Iran into bad behavior. And as I mentioned, Iran by all accounts was complying with the terms of the JCPOA, which in itself was a very complex, fraught, uh, but a significant step in international diplomacy. Now, sanctions, uh, which is really what uh, I'm focusing on uh, to set the scene and to give you the background to economic sanctions in Iran, which is the topic of tonight under the maximum pressure policy by the Trump administration, have been described in the literature in a variety of ways. They have been likened to carpet bombs because they burn indiscriminately, they kill, destroy, ruin. They've been described in the literature as murder. They've been described as economic warfare. The Iranian government every now and then uses uh, this term and uh, economic terrorism is the term that Jawad Zaif, Iran's uh, foreign secretary, uh, uh, mentions. And my own uh, preferred term, economics, uh, we weapons of mass destruction for reasons that I hope to illustrate briefly uh, in the coming minutes. Now, we have to remember that um, my focus is on economic sanctions. The, there is a wide array of different tools uh, used as sanctions. Some are like outright military blockades, arms embargoes, embargoes on particular sensitive advanced technologies, restrictions on admissions of related, uh, listed persons, like travel ban and so on and so forth, freezing of assets, individuals, persons, entities. But what I'm referring to, economic sanctions uh, are economic tools used to force a change in the behavior of a target country. And again, there are different uh, types of form of economic sanctions, uh, for instance, like blockading the central bank, like assets freeze, like trade sanctions and uh, financial sanctions. And, and Sanctions, economic sanctions can consist of some or all of the above. And the more comprehensive they are, the more, the harder they bite and the more difficult they are to uh, withstand. One thing which is very important to realize uh, in understanding the, the sanctions as, a, as an economic tool is that they are really uh, designed uh, to hurt, to destabilize, and to ruin another country's uh, economy. Uh, Although, as we shall see, uh, they are often presented as a better alternative to more extreme actions like the war. As a tool in foreign policy, they have been on the rise um, in the past century since the uh, First World War. Specifically since the 1990s, we've had on average seven sanctions each year, a total of 66, and of which two-thirds are uh, imposed or introduced by USA. Under the Clinton administration alone, something like 40% of the world population, uh, roughly 2.3 billion, were living on some kind of, some form of economic sanctions. So as you can see, Iranians are not the only ones. Um, currently, however, the USA has a total of 8,000 uh, sanctions in place worldwide, with those uh, levied against Iran, admittedly, the harshest. It's not just the USA, of course. Russia has sanctions against Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, and 
uh, China also uses uh, sanctions against Japan and the Philippines and in some other forms against Korea, uh, restricting passenger flights and so on and so forth. So sanctions take a variety of forms and are used for different purposes. That's the, uh, that's the point. There are also multilateral or UN sanctions and within the US, UN, UN uh, Article 41, there is um, provision for taking measures which do not involve the use of armed forces but in circumstances specified as uh, posing a threat to peace, breaches of the peace, or acts of aggression. I leave it to your judgment to decide whether on 8 May 2018, when the JCPOA was ab abrogated, there was any of these conditions uh, meet, uh, applying. Uh, but in general, the UN, uh, since 1966, has introduced some 30 sanctions, mostly against states, I've put in bold those states that are in the Middle East, Lebanon, Sudan, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but sanctions can also uh, be introduced against non-state entities like the so-called ISIS, Islamic State, uh, Al-Qaeda, and Taliban, etc. Now, what's very interesting, and this is a marked feature of economic sanctions, that they are imposed by large countries. They're not uh, something that you would see happen between, for instance, Luxembourg uh, sanctioning Germany or San Marino sanctioning Italy. Uh, to make a difference, you really have to be big and be able to act as a, as a bully. Uh, and statistics, evidence show that in many cases, if you take the GDP or the size of the imposing country, the so-called sending countries, relative to those receiving, being the, at the receiving end of the sanctions, uh, in majority of cases, the, 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 the different discrepancy is huge. In 80% of cases, senders are 10 times bigger than uh, target countries. Um, and on this basis, I worked out that uh, the quartet blockade against Qatar, you would remember that in June 2017, uh, UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Egypt blockaded Qatar. If you compare their relative GDPs, you're talking about a ratio of nine to one. So that's the scale. In the case of Iran, if you take the e unilateral sanctions by EU and uh, the US during Obama's uh, administration, 2010 to 2015, before the nuclear deal was signed, the ratio is 80 times. So we're talking about Rio uh, discrepancies. Those who impose sanctions are, of course, uh, um, attracted by the possibility of uh, sanctions being effective. Uh, I, every time I talk about success, I put it in inverted commas because you have to remind the, uh, we have to remind ourselves that success is seen from the perspective of the sending countries. But generally, uh, if we define success to mean achieving or attaining the stated objectives, and this is a uh, murky area because the stated objectives or explicit ob objectives are not always the true intentions behind sanctions. And you have to uh, uh, examine the real intentions. But in general, there are four or five uh, factors that can help the uh, sending nations achieve their stated aims. One is, as I've already mentioned, relative size. The other one is trade linkages. If Papua New Guinea and Spain don't trade much, and if Spain, even if it is bigger than uh, Papua New Guinea, imposes economic sanctions, it's not going to make much difference. Trade linkages, the integration between the two sides. Type of sanctions I've already alluded to, uh, how comprehensive they are. The Obama-era sanctions against Iran were not new. Iran, uh, since 1979, has been under some form of sanctions, asset seizure from early days of the revolution, and in fact with the US embassy hostage taking. Uh, then we had the uh, trade sanctions during the Clinton administration in the 1990s, which was focused on Iran's oil sector, and Iran kind of bypassed them because they were not comprehensive. In the latter phase, they were all encompassing because they included uh, financial uh, transactions, banking, shipping, insurance, and so on and so forth. So that makes it much more difficult. The fourth factor is the economic uh, and political uh, health and well-being of the, the, the domestic country. 
And ironically, evidence suggests that uh, dictators, autocrats are much better at dealing with sanctions. This is not uh, an argument in favor of them, but it shows societies which are more amenable to open discussion, public debate, diversion of opinion, and uh, so on and so forth. They are more susceptible, if not fragile, when it comes to external pressure of the kind. Last but not least, there's a time factor. Again, evidence suggests that the longer sanctions are in place, the less likely they are in achieving uh, their objectives. Well, look at Cuba, look at Zimbabwe, look at Myanmar, uh, look at North Korea. Do I need to give you more examples? Which means, really, for sanctions to be able to fight in the way they are meant to uh, uh, affect the target country, it's the first couple of years. And, and I think it's easy to understand because uh, target countries learn to find ways of circumventing sanctions, mainly by learning by doing. Recently, Javad Zarif again uh, stated that Iran has a PhD in dealing with sanctions, and we can export this expertise. Uh, it's not a position I envy being in, but uh, that's the level of expertise that Iran claims they have. Now, in assessing sanctions, there are two sides. Uh, to consider. One is success, which I have uh, alluded to, and that can be defined in terms of uh, the ability to achieve uh, the explicit objectives. And one is the costs. And I want to spend a few uh, seconds on each. But what connects these two sides is the mechanism, how, the question of how. Uh, putting aside for one moment the question of what tools and why, the question of how are these sanctions to actually bring about the desired change. As far as I can make it, there are two types of mechanisms. One is uh, you create a sufficient hardship, hoping that uh, the target countries will implode from within. And, and I think this is something that uh, the Trump administration is hoping for. Uh, the second one, uh, more outright expectation, if the first one doesn't work, is that, well, if the regime doesn't change its behavior, let's get rid of it. Let's uh, institute a regime change. So it's between these two uh, that we uh, measure. This, th th these are the two metrics for, for, for judging the success of sanctions. But on the benefits, on the objectives, um, I would... I would call for caution because, as I said, sometimes the true intention behind sanctions are not uh, so clear. Uh, sanctions are used in a variety of ways uh, to the, the most common uh, possibility is for, uh, you know, containing nuclear proliferation. They are mentioned in relation to human rights, counterterrorism. Uh, conventional weaponry, Iran's missile program is mentioned in this context, and of course, growing regional influence. On the costs, uh, what is interesting is that, of course, um, sanctions cause damage. Some of this damage, uh, economic damage, especially on infrastructure, on public health, on infant mortality, lost GDP, etc., these are relatively easier to measure. And there's ample evidence. Uh, from the experience of Iraq, for instance, what uh, costs were incurred on Iraq. But what is more difficult uh, to measure and perhaps easier to forget is are the, are the hidden costs. Hidden costs in terms of sanctions, uh, weakening civil society, fanning uh, sectarianism, uh, which is again what happened uh, with the weakening of the Basis regime uh, in Iraq, uh, which which uh, led to annihilation of civil society institutions and so on. And another set of costs or outcomes are unanticipated, anarchy and chaos, and of course at the extreme failed states. Uh, sanctions often destabilize to the point that they replace uh, an, a regime with, uh, with a failed state. And that's unfortunately, sadly, very true of several countries in the Middle East. Um, it is very common for uh, proponents of sanctions to exaggerate their effectiveness uh, and uh, underestimate their costs. Let me now offer you uh, my thoughts on why despite uh, the hardship, despite the destructive force that economic sanctions 
are, they have been so uh, uh, widely used. And I think the uh, prevailing ideology uh, in favor of sanctions has been uh, suffering from what I call seven fallacies. The first one is sanctions are generally presented as better alternatives, more humane alternatives to war. We don't want war, so we have no other option than sanctions. Yeah, the problem with this is it, A, undermines uh, the role of international diplomacy, and B, as I said, it uh, underestimates the p potential costs, especially when you take into account un unanticipated outcomes and so on and so forth. Uh, and very often, as we have seen, again, evidence suggests sanctions, in fact, paved the way for wars. They're not alternatives to war. It's not a binary uh, choice between sanctions or war, because very often what is required is, uh, you know, common sense, international diplomacy, and, and sitting round tables and talking. The second uh, widespread um, fallacy is that if sanctions are hurting, they're working. You see this every time uh, the Trump administration officials talk about Iran or in the past Iraq, they cite evidence of hardship with a glee, with almost pride. And of course that is offered as evidence of sanctions being effective. And, and I've, I have a problem understanding why uh, a tool which is actually applied, and this relates to the third uh, misconception, this is something that is uh, like collective punishment. Basically, it uh, imposes maximum pain on everybody. And I don't believe uh, sanctions are smart. And, and again, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that uh, both in Iran and in Iraq, uh, the fragile, uh, the real poor sections of the population and the middle class are squeezed both economically and otherwise, and the social cost. Uh, the main burdens on their shoulder. I have seven uh, uh, fallacies. I have one more minute. So the fourth one is uh, sanctions are uh, promoted as if they are necessary for uh, preserving, defending human rights. Well, this is another fallacy. The irony is that sanctions play into the hands of autocrats to close down the space for civil society institutions for public debate, for questioning uh, authority of the very states that they are trying to change their behavior of. And again in Iraq and in Iran, uh, in Iran until uh, the breach of sanctions in 2018 by the Trump administration, there was a lot of internal debate, very critical of Rouhani administration, open public debate about the shortcomings of his economic policies and so on. And lo and behold, that space has been closed down because there's now this threat, external aggression from outside. So that uh, has not uh, helped human rights. Number five, sanctions are necessary and effective for regime change. Well, I think I've already mentioned, uh, this is probably the poorest argument in favor of sanctions. Sanctions have had a very weak record of changing regimes. Number six, sanctions weaken the target government. Well, again, the evidence suggests that the main impact is on the private sector, ironically, and strengthens the hands of the public sector and the uh, public institutions, government institutions of the target uh, government in uh, expanding their control over uh, strategic uh, logistical supply and distribution uh, resources at a time when shortages caused by sanctions begin to bite. Last, sanctions are effective against nuclear proliferation. Well, uh, since 1970, uh, four countries have joined the nuclear club, uh, Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. Three of the four were subject to economic sanctions. So that's another uh, stark reminder of the inefficiency and ineffectiveness of economic sanctions. I hope uh, I have persuaded that sanctions are the real weapons of mass destruction, although they're used to uh, justify attempts uh, put in place to counter uh, presence of economic uh, weapons of mass destruction. And, and I think the uh, best analogy is between famine and malnutrition. Famine kills large numbers in a relative short period of time. So it makes the headlines, malnutrition can kill even more over a longer period of time. Perhaps it's not as dramatic 
sanctions, economic sanctions, can kill, damage, ruin, destroy, destabilize uh, societies, economies over a significant period of time. Maybe they're not as sexy as war is. They are as, if not more, uh, destructive. Thank you. I should stay put. Yeah, I just I just stay put. No, nah, it's okay. I, if I wander off, then please tell me. So uh, thanks very much for the invitation to talk here. I, I think uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Iranian economy, and I'm going to sort of follow up on Hassan and, and say what has actually been the impact of, uh, of sanctions on the Iranian economy, because um, maximum pressure implies that you will eventually crumble. And uh, the question really is, do sanctions, we have, we've had, we have a long history of sanctions in Iran, Hassan referred to 40 years of sanctions, so we can use the data available, quarterly data available to see what are the impact of sanctions on the, uh, on the Iranian economy. But, I, but I, actually the argument I want to make is that sanctions are probably the least of the problems of the Iranian economy. There's so many other things going on uh, affecting uh, the efficiency of the of the economy. So I, I hope to bring some of those to light and then talk a little bit about the mismanagement of the economy and uh, sort of things that we can do regardless of whether we are under sanctions or not. In fact, sanctions might be a good opportunity to think about our policies. So, and then Yar is going to follow up with the practitioners. <laughs> so just to, for those of you who don't know, uh, we talk a lot about Iran and as if sanctions have really brought us down to, 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 the, to our knees. But in fact, uh, Iran has been suffering uh, 40 years of uh, volatility, uncertainty, 40 years of uh, economic uh, uh, mismanagement, a long period of war, and, um, and very, very severe uh, financial uh, sanctions mo most recently. So wh what is the outcome? What's, what's happened in the economy? So we, one of the things we, as economists, we learn is that high inflation is generally bad, and I'm going to come to it. So we have had very high and persistent inflation. So on average, about 20%. If you look at the global average, it's between four to five. If you look at the US, it's about two. So it's quite, it's quite substantial, and it, it really has implications for uh, volatility in exchange rates, for instance. We have a very skilled, I mean, we have a lot of potential in Iran. We have a highly skilled labor force. Uh, we have a very big economy, but we also have very high unemployment rate and, and very, very low uh, female labor force participation. So, and the other aspects uh, that, People have covered that financial sector-wise, we're very fragile in terms of the banking sector, and even so more fragile now that we uh, under these sanctions. And from my point of view, the major problem we have, and that's why in one way sanctions have been to some extent effective, is that oil revenues still play a substantial role in not only in just the fo foreign exchange uh, uh, reserves, um, about 60%, but also in terms of government revenues which actually, if you compare to the GCC, is fairly low, right? So if you look at Saudi Arabia, they're highly, highly dependent. If you look at Kuwait, highly, highly dependent on oil. We've, we've done better, but, uh, but still it's, uh, it's problematic. And the uh, final thing is this, uh, what sanctions do, they create uh, inequality, and uh, the inequality is there, but they, they, they exacerbate inequality and poverty. So sanctions, obviously, they're, they're in a way targeting the most vulnerable uh, section of the population. Okay, so what, why, why oil? Oil is, from my point of view as an economist, we generally think about Dutch disease, oil is a curse, get, don't touch that stuff, do not extract. In fact, that's not, very, that's not true, because oil in itself is, uh, has been a blessing for, for the Iranian economy. So these numbers uh, show you the correlation. Uh, uh, you, if, you don't, if you don't believe me, we've done some more extended studies I, uh, I, 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 I can refer you to. But basically, if you look at, this is, this is pre-revolution, right? This is from the Shah's time onwards. And you can see that uh, oil really has been a blessing in terms of higher oil export revenue it, uh, has led to higher economic growth in the economy, okay? So what's the problem uh, with the oil? What's the problem with sanctions? What's, what are the problems with, with having this revenue? And one of those things is that we are, we are extremely volatile. So Iran is the thing that goes up and down a lot. Uh, you want to compare it to the pink line. You can't really see, see very well. I'll upload these. But uh, the pink line is, is Middle East. And Iran's uh, uh, volatility has been huge. 
I'll give you some numbers, it's been almost six times the global uh, uh, average. What does that mean? It says consumers, right? Imagine that every year people tell you uh, that you don't really know what your income is going to be. You can't plan. And if you can't plan, you withhold investment. If you don't, if you don't save, you don't get investment, you don't get any long-term economic growth. So really, the, this has been the, the biggest problem for the Iranian economy. Sanctions play into this. But sanctions is a very small part of the uh, uh, small part in, in this. And so, um, obviously, if you compare it to GCC, the volatility in GCC has only been three times as much as the globe. So they have been better at uh, uh, dampening the effects of the volatility. Iran has obviously been, uh, uh, um, uh, as opposed to Saudi Arabia, Iran has a very long period of uh, uh, you know, war, uh, eight years of war. So all these things uh, obviously exacerbates the volatility. So uncertainty is very bad. So in a way, we're winning the, in Iran, we're winning, a, uh, we're winning a lottery. Every year we're winning a lottery because we have the oil, we can sell it on the markets, except for last year. We, we sell this oil on the market and we get the revenues, right? The problem we have is the management of this revenue. And what, what's happening here is that we win the lottery, but we don't know what to do with it. Instead of saving it for bad times, like now, we've been spending it. So that's, um, uh, that's the moral of the story. I want to talk about three sources of volatility and then I come to sanctions. So if you, apologies, this is in uh, Farsi, but so you can see I Iran is this, not the volatility, This is very high. This is bad, right? So, and, and this, uh, uh, this is really the fundamental uh, problem with uh, the, I think, the, uh, the state of the Iranian economy. Um, the other thing people, hear, people say is, ah, oh, but you know, uh, you should look at oil revenue, oil volatility, price volatility is very low, you know, it's not been that high. It goes up and down, but it's not very high. But actually what, what really matters for an oil exporter is actually the oil revenue volatility. So it's a combination of production and prices. So for Iran, it's been, uh, it's been terrible. So this oil price volatility is very low. It's been on the 70s, uh, OPEC, a little bit high. Here, not, not much is going on. But really, what's happening is that the uh, dashed black line is always higher, which basically means that we, we have experienced much, much higher levels of volatility. I'll give you some numbers here. The, the far uh, right column is much higher than just this. This is what most economies try to offer. Have been uh, susceptible to this volatility, and some of it is obviously due to sanctions, but not all of it. Okay. And really, uh, if you, I, I like scatter plots. This is for Iran. This is oil revenue volatility for Iran, and this is the growth in output per capita. So we've had a positive uh, impact of the oil revenue, uh, but the, per, the effect on income from oil revenue volatility has been very negative. So the story is really uncertain and volatility. So. How is this volatility going to change? So Trump is one factor. Another factor is actually uh, shale oil. And we were just discussing, actually, because shale oil has become more important, uh, has the Strait of Hormuz become less important? It's, it's possible. But it, what this is telling you is a bit about oil. I don't know if you follow the oil market. It's very important for Iran. But oil prices, this is what sanctions introduced, right? But the thing really that killed Iran was the fall in oil prices. It was reduced by 50% in 2014, and they remained low. So that really hurt the, uh, uh, the revenues. Um, and, and what this is telling you is that the U.S. has been really, the U U.S. production has been increasing. And it's plateaued a bit, but it's been increasing. It's been, and U.S. production has doubled over the last 10 years. So, and what does that do? That, that does this to Iran. So Iran is here. This is Iran, Algeria, and uh, what other country? Don't remember. But they're very similar. Whenever there is an uh, increase in oil production from the U.S., we get hit. And how do we get hit is that the, these things measure growth rates. So our growth, on average, has been, every time it gets hit, you get 1.2% shaved off your growth. That's, that's a big number. GCC is worse, right? In this sense, GCC is worse. So economic growth GCC drops by 2%. It's much higher. And the, uh, and, and the rest of the world really benefits because it's cheap oil, right? So uh, advanced economies benefit, but Iran gets hit. But this is... Bottom line, this is the volatility in, in, um, that's affecting the economies. Okay, so this is one of my favorite uh, uh, graphs. I, 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 I love it. What this, this is telling you is that actually for Iran, it's not just about foreign policy, but it's also oil policy. 
just like the foreign policy, Trump's foreign policy is not very consistent, uh, unless somebody agrees. Uh, but I think it, it seems highly I inconsistent. It, and this is a very nice picture showing you that actually oil policy is very inconsistent. But what it does is it creates uncertainty in the market. And uncertainty in the market means revenues for Iran fluctuates more. Okay? So it wakes up and tweets, you know, saying, you know, OPEC, has it, OPEC is at it again. Come on, guys. Keep oil prices low. Markets fluctuate a bit. But not, but not too much, but it creates uncertainty. And the problem is, on one hand, we want cheap oil, you, you know, advanced economies, we want cheap oil. US wants cheap oil. Elections happen quite often. We want cheap oil. On the other hand, we want sanctions on Iran, but sanctions on Iran translates into higher oil prices. And on, and on the other hand, we have these wars uh, with, uh, with uh, China and, and the EU, uh, tra or trade disagreements. So um, the, other, the other player is OPEC. OPEC is also creating this volatility, and this is Saudi production. Uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Riyadh, I didn't want to put it uh, at Saudi, but this is really Saudi policy, right? Saudi, Saudi production ramps up, ramps up, ramps up, and what, this is when it was announced, Trump announced that he would you know, put out sanctions uh, uh, on Iran, so that was the big QA, and what the Saudi did was they increased production a lot. And guess what? Iranian production didn't drop that much, exports didn't drop that much, and the Saudis had to uh, reverse their uncertainty. And I think this is, fun, this is management of these uncertainties are much more uh, important than actually the, the role uh, than sanctions uh, in terms of economic growth. Okay? So what do we do about it? We basically need better institutions. If we have better institutions, uh, we can dampen the effects of volatility. This is not just Iran. This is loads of countries. And what this measures, this, this is discretionary policy by the government in terms of increasing expenditure. So one of the examples is, you know, uh, in Arab Spring, there was a huge injection into social expenditure by uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And that's what this measures. So you basically, you're not smoothing the business cycle, you're just spending money to keep people happy. And what that does is creates this uh, GDP growth volatility. And not surprisingly, the more discretionary stuff you do, which is not good for the economy, the worse institutional quality you have. The lower institutional quality, higher, higher um, uh, uh, fiscal policy volatility. Okay, so what we need is you know better institutions. But uh, what does that what does that mean? Uh, it basically it's not just about being you know democratic or accountable you know like Norway. It's really about having an institution which uh, uh, absorbs the shocks. So whenever we are hit, it's like a, we are like a yo-yo. The economy is like a yo-yo. It goes down. Whenever oil prices go up, we go up. Whenever oil prices drop, sanctions, we go down. And that that's not very healthy for the economy. We basically need to smooth these. Uh, fluctuations. Okay, so what about sanctions? So are sanctions, if volatility is bad and sanctions create volatility, how bad are they really for the Iranian economy? And so some of the work we, um, we did is a counterfactual. Basically, this is like, you don't have the data. This is, this is just before the multilateral sanctions. So we said, okay, imagine that the multilateral sanctions are imposed. They hadn't been imposed. Imagine they were imposed. What would be the effect on the Iranian economy? The answer is Actually, uh, there was uh, most recent, one of the most recent Nobel Prize winner, Nordhaus. He works on climate change. But so I, I was reading about him and was fascinated. He actually had some comments about sanctions, which basically said sanctions basically don't do anything. They don't affect oil prices. They don't affect production. And then they don't have any impact on the target country. So, and that's really what we're getting. What we're getting is oil prices following sanctions uh, go up a little bit, but really zero effect. Global equity market, no effect. What about the, wh why is that? Because we know that Iranian oil supply drops, oil, ex oil production, oil exports drop, but that's because Saudi has compensated for it. So global markets are, you know, as business as usual. So Iran is sanctioned, so Saudi increases. What does that mean about Iranian GDP? So here is the, if you want to bring a country down to its knees, you're gonna, you gotta choke off its main revenue, right? So per oil, per oil, oil is a huge part of the government's revenue, so what you're doing is basically you're shaving off, what this is showing you, 1.5% per quarter maximum, time, so the annualized would be 6%. The maximum impact uh, to sanctions will have, a multilateral sanctions, with 1 million drop in barrel uh, exports uh, of oil per day, basically will reach the 6% drop. But in the long run, what it does, it shaves off maybe 3.5%, 3.2%. But this is, not a, this is not a growth rate, this is a level. So what happens in the Iranian economy is that our loss, our the potential we could have would be zero. This would be no transfer. 
What we are using now is 3% of GDP. This is not very big. Okay, so sanctions by themselves, although the oil export is huge drop in oil export, in terms of economic activity, they grow, the level of GDP drops by 6% let us say, and reverts back in a steady state by 3% below its pre-sanction period. I run these things actually this morning for uh, data up to 2018, so just before May, uh, before the sanctions were, the, you know, unilateral sanctions were imposed, you get a very similar story. Magnitudes are very similar. So sanctions by themselves are, are, are not going to uh, basically bring the Iranian economy down to its knees. Okay? I think that's, uh, that, that's clear. Okay, do, I ha do I have a few minutes? I just want to talk about policies. Okay, so what, what, are we, what are we going to do about this? So what we need to do about uh, uh, management of the economy, uh, having a better management, so sanctions are there. Sh they, are, they are shaving off 3, three to 4 percent of uh, GDP. It's not very big. The Great Recession shaved off 10 percent. That's not, you know, 3, three to 4 percent is manageable. The problem is that the sanctions, uh, we are hit by sanctions. Every time you get hit by sanctions, it shaves off 3 percent. So the first round was 3 percent. The second round is 3 percent. We're 6 percent below potential. Okay. Um, now, what, what can we do about it? What this graph shows you is about that is, is diversification. Our, our uh, share of oil in the economy is still quite substantial. This is one of the things that uh, we, ne we, need to, we need to think about and target. The other thing that we need to do, and this is, re this is regardless of sanctions happening or not, is to really think about spending side of things. Because what the government is doing is subsidizing huge parts of the uh, economy. Um, fuel, for example. And uh, as opposed to the GCC, is actually Iran has tried to uh, win the economy of subsidies. Uh, unfortunately, the direct transfers are sort of larger than the subsidies. Um, and we'll also talk about uh, 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 tax administration. I mean, tax income is huge, right, in the advanced economies. In Iran, it's not very big because we don't have the capacity. Um, what about monetary policy? So monetary policy, basically, you want an independent central bank. Uh, that's what the, all economists will tell you. You want, you, you want the independence of central bank because they can think about how, uh, what is an optimal monetary policy. I want to talk to you about this. This is the big problem for Iran, inflation. So what do you notice? This is Iranian inflation across time. And this is the global inflation. This is a, this is a problem because it creates a big wedge between uh, domestic and foreign inflation. Why is this problematic? problematic because these wedges, they can, they can sustain for a short period of time, but if they keep the, you know, the, the differential kept, they translate into foreign exchange prices. So, and, the, and I, I hope to convince you, uh, so this, this is a good graph. This shows you whenever, up, uh, whenever inflation goes up, it's negatively associated with the inflation rate. So usually we're like, oh, sanctions happen. That, that boosted inflation. That, you know, we can't deal with that. Uh, things are becoming more expensive. But actually, sanctions are a trigger for something that was there before. Okay? The, underlying, the underlying issue is the management of the uh, monetary policy. Um, in a way, we are printing, uh, uh, we are, uh, these, okay, so I, I don't know if you know the history. Uh, uh, these we are, are a very regular pattern. If you invest this, which is uh, 67 years from now, we're going to have another exchange rate crisis. Okay? It's pretty predictable because what we're doing is we're running very high, high inflation over a very long period of time, where the rest of the world is running a two to five percent inflation annually, the wedge, in the, uh, you know, the theory is the purchasing power parity. Eventually, it has to equilibrate, and what it does is usually the trigger would be some war, sanction, or some other uh, some other disaster. But so, what's the problem with that? Again, this creates uncertainty in the economy. So, which I mean, we attribute this latest devaluation on depreciation of the currency. On purely on the sanctions, but actually, the, uh, they they would have happened. I think if you speak to most economists, they would argue that these uh, the, the uh, depreciation of the currency would have happened regardless of the of the sanctions. Eventually, that would have happened. Okay, um, and one of the problems with that, uh, I mean, uh, we are not the only ones that have high levels of inflation, right? So if you look at Latin America, uh, 20 years ago, it was a very similar story, a very very high inflation rate. And the main reason we have a high inflation rate is because there is this social contract which says that we should be able to afford X, Y, and Z. And so the government props up these uh, items. 
And by the way, this happened during the, during the Shah as well. This has happened throughout the history of Iran. Um, and and that, creates, uh, that creates the pressure, okay? All right, uh, the other issue with the oil revenue is not only that we get lower growth, we are susceptible to um, uh, uh, oil prices, production volatility, but it also creates exchange rate volatility. That's the, that's the argument. So in order to manage this, we need to think about saving our oil money, not just, not just spending it uh, is the story. Okay, finally, um, I, the, the other issue is usually we want to create a business environment. We need to create uh, you know, foreign direct investment. We, we, want to, we want to boost the private sector. And so there is this group which have a, a, a very wide reach in the economy, in many sectors of the economy, in petrochemicals, agriculture, health, and so on. And the problem with, uh, I mean, obviously they're, they're under renewed US sanctions, but the problem with this is that uh, we know that when, uh, when uh, you, know, you have these actors, what they do is they, they incentivize cronyism, and that's not good for economic growth either. So this is another, this is another thing that's hitting economic growth. Um, excellent, okay. So basically what, uh, what we need to think about is that, yeah, sanctions have harmed the Iranian economy, but in the, in the, in the last 40 years, they're only a very small part of the, part of the story. The main part of the story is that we're, uh, the Iranian economy is not resilient. And so uh, how to make the Iranian economy resilient, we need to go down the diversification route. This is regardless of whether sanctions are in place or not. We need to think better fiscal policies, better monetary policies. We need to think about uh, uh, regional development policies. There are regions in, um, I don't know if you, um, you know, we had these sort of mini protests in the country. And if you look at, if you map where these things were happening, they weren't happening in big cities. They were happening in outside of big cities. Why, were, why, were, why is that? It's because basically the development policy that Iran, we, we, we've been implementing has been very city focused. We've forgotten about the regions, the big cities. So this is another thing that we need to do. And obviously the, uh, we need to think about and uh, getting rid of this uh, uh, re reliance of giving people loans and that they're not going to, you know, they're not doing anything productive uh, with it. Sorry, I overran, but uh, the bottom line is there is a lot to do in Iran. We should not just sit back and say, oh, it's the sanctions and, you know, uh, sanctions have uh, led to lower growth rates, sanctions have led to higher uncertainty, uh, or the sanctions are, are the issue, and we can't do anything about it unless we, the sanctions are lifted. Actually, there's huge amounts of work that can be uh, done in the Iranian economy. Okay, well, um, thank you all for uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. So I, I basically agree with everything that Kamiar has just said, but I'm gonna sort of look at the same problem from a slightly different angle. Uh, my vantage point is really from the vantage point of, of companies and what types of companies are working with Iran and how does sanctions impact that? So while I think that Kamiar's analysis is absolutely true that in, at a broad macro level, there's a resiliency in the Iranian economy which could be increased if there's institutional improvements. There's a compositional change that may take place in the economy if you have sanctions over an extended period of time, and that's what I'm going to uh, focus on. So the, the title of the, the presentation is, Is Iran in a Deglobalization Spiral? And what I mean by deglobalization is basically a set of policy choices. It's policy choices from the targeting country, so let's say the US, which is trying to cut financial links and uh, eliminate trade ties through the imposition of coercive economic measures, whether they're tariffs or sanctions. But it's also the policy choices of the country that's being targeted. So a country like Iran, faced with sanctions or faced with general economic volatility, may choose to limit itself, to isolate itself uh, in order to pr protect itself from economic shocks. And companies are essentially stuck in the middle. And what I mean here is companies that work uh, cross-border. Let's say it's a multinational company or a, a small medium enterprise that is an exporter. So where does the story sort of come from with Iran? And I think I'm gonna focus on really the reimposition of sanctions after the JCPOA. And basically what we see is that the JCPOA experience was one where sanctions relief failed to restore Iran's links to the global financial system. And that was predominantly because U.S. primary sanctions remained in place and therefore any 
an uh, entity with a link, what's called a nexus, to a U.S. person or, or other institution or use of the U.S. dollar is not able to trade with Iran. And so if you're a bank and we're talking about U.S. dollars, that means that you're essentially unable to, to deal with Iran. And what that meant is there was a knock-on effect because the companies that were trying to conduct trade with Iran faced a lot of practical challenges in accessing basic banking services. And so you've seen an impact on trade with Europe and increasingly an impact on trade with China that I'm going to talk about. What that means is that Iranian industries are, are increasingly isolated. The backbone of Iran's industrialization starting in the 1960s was basically European. So uh, Iranian cookies are baked in uh, Italian industrial ovens. Iran's automobiles are of French design. The power generation systems are predominantly German. And the technology and the inputs that go into the manufacturing base in Iran depend on those global supply chains. And this goes back you know, well before the age of what we typically call globalization, but it's especially acute right now. So the problem is that if you impose sanctions on a country like Iran and you cut these ties, you're also elim eliminating an incentive for the kinds of economic reforms or economic development models that depend on or uh, conform to globalization. So there's a pressure on Iran right now. Does it want to become more financially transparent? Does it want to continue trading with the West, for example? Or does it want to close itself off because it feels that it's in a kind of a spiral? So why did sanctions relief fail? I, I, I'll touch on this briefly just because I think it's important and also because London is, is sort of a center of this question. But basically the problem you have is that the US does not have the institutional capacity to lift sanctions. The Treasury Department has gotten really good at imposing sanctions, but what we saw in the period after the implementation of the JCPOA was that when John Kerry, for example, came here to London had a meeting, and that's the picture behind here, with uh, the sort of senior executives of some of the largest banks, what we would call tier one banks. He said to them, guys, we've lifted secondary sanctions. Iran is complying with this deal. You can go in and conduct your financial transactions. There are a lot of really big companies that would like your financing and your commercial banking. And the quote here is from the chief legal officer of HSBC, a guy named Stuart Levy, who was previously a US government official and he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal after that meeting and basically said, how can we possibly listen to what you've just said? You've spent the last 10 years telling us not to do business with Iran. Now you show up and you're telling us to do business with Iran. We can't take you seriously. And we don't feel that there's enough clarity on the guidance that we would want to do business. Um, and that, that actually applies for most major international financial institutions. The compliance officers were really scared off of dealing with Iran. There was an immediate impact on trade with Europe. So the hope was that after implementation of the JCPOA, Iran would receive sanctions relief and trade would rebound. And it did. But it didn't rebound fast enough or uh, with enough significant uh, uh, direct investment into Iran to really shore up the nuclear deal and the incentive structure around it. So let me show you that. Um, so this is a graph that shows European exports of machinery and transport equipment to Iran. So this is the technology and the inputs that are really important for the industrial base. And you'll see this runs from January of 2018 uh, to January of uh, 2019. So the year when Trump was basically deciding that uh, he was going to uh, pull out of the agreement. And we were at around 400 million uh, in exports every month consistently. This is in uh, euros for the whole EU 28. When you see on that red line, that's in November when the sanctions were reimposed, a really quick decline. What's also interesting is that that big spike is in October. There was this big effort on the part of the industrial partners of uh, Iranian companies to sell a lot in October before the sanctions were reimposed which actually suggests something about the strength of these commercial relationships. The situation was getting worse this whole year, but companies were working to sustain their trade until finally, legally, the jeopardy was too great. There are, however, categories of trade that are still important and taking place. Um, you know, Europe is unique because it's the primary trading partner for medical, uh, pharmaceuticals and medical equipment to Iran. So this bottom, darker section, 
European exports from 1996 to about, I think this is 2018. And you'll see that right above it, the next level is China. It took a long time for China to become a major exporter to Iran in these categories, but Europe is still the primary supplier. So there's a huge incentive for Iran to keep trade with Europe going uh, because it's, it has to do with basic uh, public needs like healthcare. So the European policymakers are faced with a dilemma. They've promised through the JCPOA that they're going to engage economically with Iran. U.S. has violated the deal, pulled out, with uh, reimposed sanctions, and is making it harder for Europeans to conduct that trade. Even in categories like medicine, because if you're a medical company, sanctions exemptions allow you to sell equipment or pharmaceuticals to Iran, but you can't get a bank to help you with that transaction. So an Iranian importer can't simply wire you money. They have to find a very expensive and, and uh, intermediated route to pay uh, for those goods. So one of the solutions that's been devised is a state-owned trade intermediary called Instex, and you've maybe seen this in the news, and it's the UK, France, and Germany uh, as the shareholders of a company that's supposed to coordinate the payment instructions. And the idea is to eliminate the need for a cross-border financial transaction. So if you're a European exporter to Iran of a pharmaceutical, you're not getting paid by an Iranian company directly. Instead, Instex finds a European importer of a good from er Iran and the importer pays the European exporter. So the payment stays within Europe, and there's a mirror transaction in Iran. This isn't operational yet. They've been working on this since, uh, in seriously since about November, and it's still coming along. And it's one of the things that a lot of hopes are pinned on, because Iran is saying, look, you have to show us the bare minimum if we're going to stay in this deal. And the reality is that this is not going to be able to compensate for the full scope of sanctions, even if it's important because it will help with the trade of food and medicine. So for a long time, particularly in the previous sanctions period, Iran's strategy was, OK, we know Europe is vulnerable. They work with the US. They have exposure to the US uh, markets. We'll turn east. We'll work with China. And there's a whole discourse in Iran about economic relations needing to look east rather than west. And this was sort of true for a long time. In around 2012, 2014, uh, Chinese industrial exports to Iran exceeded those of Europe for the first time. China really stepped in and grew its trading relationship, in part because it was uh, purchasing so much Iranian oil. So Iran was earning money in China and was then able to spend it on Chinese goods. But this might not be holding true anymore. So this is a graph that shows uh, China-Iran bilateral trade from Jan uh, June 2014, so it's just around the uh, time of the nuclear negotiations until April of this year. This is data from the Chinese Customs Administration. The key line to look at is the red line. This is exports from China to Iran. And what you'll see is that historically, those exports have been up above 1.5 uh, uh, billion, which is billion dollars uh, uh, a month. And you'll see that it's fallen in around the last few months when the sanctions have been reimposed as low as below $300 million. That's a significant drop. It's, it's basically 75%. And the concern is that Chinese companies in the last 10 years have themselves become more globalized. And there's a big trade war between the US and China. And China is saying, look, we risk deglobalization vis-a-vis our trading relationship with the US if we sort of back up Iran too much in this disagreement, and we trade too much in the face of US sanctions, we risk a, a whole set of more important economic relationships. So there's a lot of concern that this means that Iran will have less of a, um, basically, a, a release valve when it comes to economic pressure. So however, the US-China trade war isn't really going great for Donald Trump. And uh, you know there was some sense that they would reach a deal maybe three, four weeks ago. That has seemingly evaporated. And for the first time since May, when the Trump administration uh, took away the waivers permitting uh, certain countries to continue to buy Iranian oil, China has purchased Iranian oil. So this is a tanker. This hasn't really been reported yet, but I thought I would show you. Um, that uh, it's a tanker called Salina. It's owned by the National Iranian Tanker Corporation. And uh, Salina has made a journey 
It left uh, in late May, and it came from Turkey, came to Iraq, and then picked up some oil at one of the terminals near uh, where the drone was dropped down. Uh, and, and you'll see this straight line. It didn't fly. The tanker didn't fly. What happens is that they turn off their transponders, and when the transponder was turned on again, it was here in the Strait of Malacca. So there's so much traffic that you don't want to not be visible to other ships. And then they turn it off again, and it arrived at a port um, named uh, Huludao near Beijing and appears to be delivering oil. There are a few other tankers coming that have made a similar journey. So the question is, and here's a picture, a satellite image of Selina at the port. Um, the question is, is this gonna make a big difference for Iran? Realistically, economically, probably not. Uh, the volumes of exports are gonna remain, remain pretty low. It's not clear that Iran will readily be able to use the proceeds of these sales. We'll have to keep an eye on the trade uh, data that comes out in two days or the previous month. Um, but nonetheless, it suggests that China is contravening U.S. sanctions directly for the first time in its purchases of oil. That's a positive sign for Iran. So that's something that we need to look at. But generally, to step back again, the problem with sanctions, and we've heard it, I think, uh, in both Hassan and Kamiro's presentation, is one of broken incentives. So we know that Iran is breaking down these trade relationships, that uh, the sanctions are breaking down the trade relationships that Iran has had with Europe and with Asia for a long time. It's limiting, it's limiting foreign investment in the country and the technology that that investment brings. And it's having domestic impacts, like the concentration of wealth among, let's say, the IRGC or certain politically elite groups and the breakdown of institutional uh, quality. So, you know, the government is struggling to respond and there's a temptation often to use uh, untransparent economic uh, tactics to mitigate the effects of sanctions, but that's not really good for the economy at large. One example of this is with the Financial Action Task Force reforms. The FATF is a global body that sets standards in anti-money laundering and terrorist finance. And for about, I think, three years, there's been an action plan for Iran to raise its standards for um, financial regulation. And they've been working on it, passing the relevant legislation. But a year ago, just about, when Trump started to withdraw from the deal, the political impetus to do those reforms really started to diminish because a lot of the um, even proponents of FATF reforms in Iran were saying, look, if we make our banks more transparent and we follow international accounting standards and anti-money laundering rules, what's the point? We don't have any correspondent banking relationships. There are currently maybe 10 small banks in Europe that will, on a case-by-case -case basis, accept a money transfer from uh, Iran. And so it's not very clear why you would do this reform. The Rouhani administration, to its credit, has been pushing for it and is saying, look, we can't self-sanction ourselves. At some point, we're going to come out of these sanctions. We have to be at international standards, or we're not going to be able to rebuild the relationships and re-earn the trust of the global financial community. Today was the plenary meeting in Florida of FATF, and once again, what's happened is that the, uh, the body has basically kicked the can down the road. They've said, okay, Iran hasn't made any progress, but we can kind of understand why. Um, let's just wait till October when the next meeting is. And they've done this several times now, which is a pragmatic move, but it doesn't really bode well for where uh, Iran is moving in terms of these types of reforms. So a hopeful note, and I didn't expect this would be the case, but maybe the hopeful note comes from a speech from uh, Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, as unlikely as that sounds. He, he gave a speech, uh, I think about a, maybe three or four weeks ago uh, in May, where he was talking about the economy. And it was maybe the most frank and practical discussion of the economy that he's had in a long time. He made two comments that I think are relevant. One is that he said, at times we may need a certain part of raw materials which has to be imported. Financial transactions for those purchases are not possible, there are problems, but we need to make a push and produce them in, in indigenously. So what's interesting about this is that this last sentence used to be all he would say. He would say, we need a resistance economy, we need self-sufficiency. He wouldn't acknowledge that you can't have an economy in today's world that doesn't have these fundamental trade links. The second thing he said, which is in a way even weirder, 
um, is he said, I have heard that in some countries of the world, half the time is needed to launch a new business. But in Iran, there are many challenges and barriers. He's basically referring to the um, World Bank's ease of doing business report and the fact that Iran has a very low ranking. So if you're a foreign company and you want to set up shop in Iran, it's a, it's a real um, maze. And it's notable that the supreme leader, despite the rhetoric about resistance, despite the rhetoric about the economic um, sort of strength in Iran, is making these acknowledgments. And I'm hopeful that that reflects an understanding in the Iranian establishment that even though there's this pressure for deglobalization being exerted from the outside, the answer is not to deepen the deglobalization by seeking basically an auto autarky situation domestically. So to conclude, I think we need to look to the future. You know, uh, inshallah, there will be negotiations between the US and Iran at some point soon. Um, and we have to wonder, what do we do about the sanctions problem? We've had one episode of sanctions relief. It really didn't work. How can Iran trust that this second time around they're going to get a better outcome? And what I think needs to happen, and, and there's some of us in the policy community sort of pushing for this, is that you need a much more intensive effort around sanctions relief. You can't simply, as a matter of legal sort of um, regulation, lift sanctions and then expect market actors and the free market to, to step in and fix the problem. You have to have a concerted effort at what I've called sanctions reconstruction. So you're actually taking the responsibility to rebuild the economy after a sanctions episode. Or alternatively, you need to think about policies of re-globalization. How do you rebuild those links in a very active way so that you're embedding within the diplomatic agreement that's reached the economic logic and the incentives to, pr to preserve that agreement even if there are uh, other disputes. And I'll end on a final point. I was in a meeting in Berlin um, a couple days ago with, and there were some uh, officials from the German Foreign Ministry, a small gathering. And at one point, a question was raised. We were talking about why would Iran leave the JCPOA right now? And the official said, what would be the economic benefit for Iran if it left the JCPOA? which I think points to the lack of understanding here about what exactly has happened to Iran's economy and the, and the difficult choices they're facing. So we have to help answer the question for why they should remain in agreement that comes next. Uh, otherwise, we're doomed to sort of repeat uh, the failures of the past. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, covered quite a lot of ground, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, so I ask that when you ask a question, you identify who you are, uh, whom you'd like to direct your question to, and that your question is actually a question rather than an explication of your thesis. Um, so I think we'll take maybe like four questions at a time. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, the first one is to Kamyar. Um, you know, you made reference to Iran's volatility and the fact that it is still oil dependent and um, its, uh, its volatility is eight times the global average, whereas the GCC countries actually are more oil dependent and yet their volatility is only three times as much. What are they doing that's better than Iran? Do they have better institutions? Do they have better management? What's going on in those countries? Um, I found that a little, um, I, I'd appreciate a, an explanation. Thank you. Um, then for um, Esfandiar, um, you know, you mentioned deglobalization. Um, my understanding is that deglobalization is now becoming a global <laughs> pattern. <laughs> um, your own field of business studies, I've, I've read a couple of articles about that, James Witt and some other people, Christopher Chase Dunn, a sociologist and a friend of mine. So um, uh, is the trend uh, towards deglobalization globally? And so why should we, in fact, isn't Iran doing something right? Um, because it's part of this, uh, you know, this global pattern. And finally, uh, for Hassan, thank you very much. For, by the way, all three papers were presentations were great and very complimentary. And for Hassan, um, if you're thinking about um, the EU versus China, um, which of these two countries is doing a better job of defying um, 
what I can only call U.S. bullying, especially with respect to Iran and sanctions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yes. This guy. Over to the right. Sorry. Oh. Behind. Yeah. <clears throat> More of a comment. Uh, what about the potential harms for the U.S.? The dollar is the dominant currency in the world, and uh, if you act like a bully, if you use it as a geopolitical tool, it's going to hurt the credibility of your currency in the long term. Do you agree with me? Uh, I can take one more now. Uh, yes. I'm leaning up front. Hi, I'm Navab. I'm a clear pharmacy student. Um, for the strong interest in politics. Um, my question is for Isfandiar, and um, recently um, there were discussions in Iran about the possibility that they might open up the forex market to all, um, to all markets, as opposed to having their establish um, 42,000 rials to $1 a policy. Um, you tweeted that it looks like they think their FX market is under control. Huge achievement. Um, do you think this bodes well for the purchasing power of all the Iranians? Thank you. Great, thank and I think I saw one more there. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Glad we did that. Um, uh, yeah. Let's take one more here. <laughs> Thank you for for the talk against the United States. I assume. <laughs> um, can we expect an era of economic stability in Iran? And if we can. Um, how far away it is. Uh, great, easy ones. Um, I don't know. So uh, I'm going to take the easy question, which was just uh, one answer. R Roman, yes. Uh, I think, the, I think uh, by uh, using these policies, and it's not just Iran, right? It's the trade wars with the EU, it's the conflicts with uh, China. I mean, if you add all of these up, eventually, um, it's going to work against uh, the U.S. being a financial power. The problem is uh, we don't have a, an alternative payment system would require an alternative set of currencies or sets of countries. And uh, I don't think we have a candidate for that. So I'll give you an example. In China, a year, about a year ago, the Shanghai Exchange started trading oil in Rambini, right? And, uh, but it didn't really take off. And the reason for that is that... Uh, uh, the government is really controlling, Chinese government is controlling fluctuations in the prices, and that really markets like fluctuations, and we should you know, let them be, and so people don't trade, and they don't trust the institutional backing of the Chinese uh, uh, state. Um, Euro would have been a great example. Unfortunately, we had the great financial crisis. We had the Greece. We had exposures of limitations of the Euro. So I think there's, uh, in the long run, I think something like Russia, Eurozone, China, would be could challenge the dollar's uh, role in the economy, and so to make to keep America great again, you really don't want to lose the financial power of the U.S. I mean, that's the number one thing you don't want to do. Okay, so and then the, quickly on the sovereign wealth fund. Um, uh, sorry, that was the answer to you, Val. The sovereign wealth fund. <laughs> so um, what we don't have, the volatility. So, okay, so Iran has been subject to many different shocks that the Saudis and the Kuwaitis have not been to, although Kuwait, we have the Gulf War, but ha haven't uh, been exposed to. But I think one of the things, a good example, is that we had the oil stabilization fund in Iran. It was actually a great success story until Ahmadinejad decided to raid it in 2005. So, uh, and that was problematic because that's when oil prices were high. And then we, had the, uh, then we had the Great Recession, the Lehman Brothers uh, collapsing, the 2009 oil prices dropped. But there was nothing in the fund. So um, I think that, the, but the Saudis have this mechanism where they dip into the sovereign wealth fund. They dipped into it severely after the uh, 2014 drop in prices and were able to sort of cushion the economy. Um, and similar with Kuwaitis. But in Kuwait, you have this institutional, uh, Kuwait has two sort of sovereign wealth funds. This one is called the General Reserve Fund, which is really a stabilization fund, and the one is a future generation fund. The Kuwaitis do not touch the future generation fund. They, they do not. The only time they dipped into the future generation fund was after Iraqi invasion for rebuilding the economy, and then they put the money back in. So you need to have these institutional um, uh, setups to, to do that. Unfortunately, in Iran, we don't. 
uh, one of the things, uh, sorry, final point, one of the things uh, we're discussing, I think today or yesterday, it was discussion in Iran that we shouldn't start dipping into the National Development Fund, which is the Iranian Sovereign Wealth Fund, to cushion the effects of uh, sanctions. So, I mean, uh, but not going, dipping into the fund when we're in good times. I mean, that's the problem with Iran. We exacerbate this volatility uh, by bad policies and bad institutions. Um, I, I will echo what Kamya said about the, the de-dollarization. I think what's interesting about this moment where it looks like deglobalization is happening everywhere is you have to extract to what extent this is about the U.S. deciding to leave uh, the sort of institutional role it's had in the global system economically and politically and, and to what extent that creates conditions for deglobalization and the response you know, seems to be that basically the Europeans, the Chinese, the Russians, they don't have consensus on this, but they want to restore multilateralism. So they're basically trying to restore the role that the dollar has played or restore the role that the US has played as kind of a convening power for a lot of the institutions that global trade uh, depends on. So for Iran, it's a weird situation because in some sense, if the U.S. keeps going down this path, it could be beneficial to Iran down the line because they will have um, a more maybe uh, sort of friendly composition of major uh, economic powers to work with. But at the same time, that process is going to be so long that I don't think Iran can bank on that. And so you have to sort of follow the reform process along the way um, until such a time that maybe there's a shift uh, and you know you could trade in with euros or with the RMB instead of the dollar. So you're saying that the economy is now broken by the money. That's U.S. driven. I would. I think. So. I mean, I don't know if economically speaking, it's U.S. driven, but I think the impetus where all of these countries are nervous about it is because someone like Trump has come in and done away with TPP and threatened NAFTA and basically decided to start a trade war with China. It's a the, from the business community standpoint, the risk is originating with the U.S. Um, and the question is, can you wait out until someone else steps in to take on that sort of safeguarding role for global trade? Should I touch on the FX market briefly? So um, this, I should be careful what I tweet because now it clearly comes back uh, and, and bites me. And the funny thing about that is I tweeted that not knowing the answer, hoping that someone like Kamiya or, or ha Hassan would respond with the answer. Um, so basically the story here is that one of the major drivers of uh, economic hardship in Iran, and Kamiar alluded to this in the last year, has been the devaluation of the real. I think it's lost around 70% of its value. Um, what's weird is that it, it seems to have slowed down recently. And the central bank has been working very hard to uh, do a few things. One is... Um, improve the repatriation of foreign currency earnings. So what was happening is that companies that were exporting and earning euros or earning other, even dollars, were not bringing that money back into Iran. They were just leaving it outside. And that was exacerbating the basically supply shortage of hard currency in Iran. Um, and it might be that they've gotten it under control. There's, there's sort of two schools of thought that I've read in the financial papers in Iran. One group says, you know, the, they have it under control and now you can shoot down a drone and the currency markets don't even move that much, which would be pretty remarkable. Well, it's, it was Thursday and Friday, so, you know, tomorrow we'll see what happens. But another camp is saying, don't get fooled, you know, if, if we move into a more dangerous situation, the dollar will start to basically appreciate against the real again. And that, that erodes purchasing power. So. I don't know, but I think it's important to watch because it's going to be a major factor in how comfortable the Iranian government feels about the economic situation and whether they can ride out sort of the storm uh, that's being thrown at them. Um, I must say I'm happy to be in uh, youthful uh, optimism. Company of uh, my uh, more youthful uh, companions here, I think what uh, Kamyar has focused on is mainly the oil uh, sector and quite rightly pointing out that uh, you know, uh, oil trade will suffer in the short term, but ultimately uh, it will recover. Uh, what you have looked at is the uh, labyrinth of much more complex financial uh, 
international financial transactions and really what we need to bring together to understand the real impact of economic sanctions on the Iranian economy is the two. Uh, it really doesn't matter how many barrels of oil you uh, uh, export uh, or how many ships switch off their transponders. If you can't put uh, your hands on the money you earn from selling them. And we know from both last round and this round that Iran is uh, uh, experiencing tremendous difficulties in the international financial arena. Even the index that uh, the European Special Vehicle that uh, Yar mentioned, uh, this has taken a long time. It's, only, it's, it's, a, it's a welcome development if and when it happens, but it's a little step and uh, too late. And it's only focused on humanitarian goods. Even that uh, which initially has raised some hope and expectations from the Iranian side hasn't borne any fruit yet. Of course, one would like to see it uh, 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 deliver results. So I would say uh, even the Iranian side is now rather surprised at the real impact sanctions have made this time uh, for a number of reasons, uh, despite the fact that the Europeans and the other signatories uh, to the JCPOA uh, still officially support that agreement. The sheer uh, size and economic power of uh, dominant economy like the US has actually uh, set the scene. Uh, and the impact on Iran uh, since then has been severe. Uh, as I said, I don't believe this is going to result in the hope or expectation from the Trump side that sanctions will succeed on terms he envisages them, but there's no doubt that the impact has been severe and, and uh, destructive. So that's my uh, point of view, and I wouldn't want to underestimate the uh, destructive impact that sanctions have had. Uh, and the, the sheer frustration, the sheer attrition, the social despondency, these are messages you get all the time from Iran, because if you withstood it last time, well done, but you know, you wear off. Hope is non-existent. Youth, give them a way out, they will, you know, get out. There's a lot of despondency and there's a lot of uh, desperation and basically people, you know, wear off. Uh, the, the real uh, uh, san sanctions re really bite at all levels. Um, the question Val put to me was about uh, EU and China. Um, well, China is a far more important uh, business and trade partner to, to Iran, uh, thanks to sanctions, because Iran has uh, knowingly and uh, deliberately uh, diversified its trading uh, towards the east. Uh, China, India, Turkey, sometime in the past it was the UAE, but the UAE has been going down in relative importance. Um, something like 18% of Chinese uh, oil imports are from Iran, or have been until recently. These figures are now changing radically. Um, China is the single most, uh, the biggest, the largest trading partner with Iran. Um, and so what China does, as I think your example showed, is watched with a lot of interest because it is the biggest partner, so that by definition uh, is more important. Europe, by contrast, is not one entity. I mean, Euro Europe is, as we know, made up, made up of well, still 28, maybe soon 27, uh, and, and of divergent interests. Some of them import oil from Iran, uh, Spain and Italy did, not huge amounts, uh, and they were the first ones to shut down the Iranian oil trade back in 2012 when uh, American unilateral sanctions were introduced. Uh, so they have that, you know, history, and this time too, politically, of course, the European governments have been quite clear in their restating their support for the agreement. But in reality, really, they've been their hands have been tied. The European enterprises, commercial entities that were poised to enter into Iran, voted with their feet very fast because, at the end of the day, they are held back by the bottom line, which means they are responsible to their boards and to their CEOs and the profitability and the shareholders. You know, they're not going to take a lecture from Federica Mogherini, no matter how well-intentioned she is. And she has been quite uh, honorable on the Iran deal, I must uh, say so. So in reality, uh, Europe 
has been very uh, much disappointing the Iranian side. And in a way, Iran, which has been uh, uh, walking a tightrope since last May, in a way is sending signals to Europe that if you don't get Axior together and do something that makes it worthwhile for us to abide by, continue to abide by the JCPOA, really there's no incentive. And, and, and the threat, and they gave 60 days, I think, uh, uh, notice to Europe to come up with the goods. Otherwise, there is no incentive to stay within the JCPOA. So I would say uh, China is more calculated, partly because of the sheer size and history of growing uh, prominence in Iranian economy. I mean, China has investment. China is uh, looking at Iran as an important part of the new Silk Road. The last two days we've had a conference on this uh, with Professor Doraj, who's visiting us uh, from, from the US uh, at SOAS. So China looks at Iran much more strategically than Europe does. And uh, just one point on volatility. I think, again, Val's uh, question is important. I don't think it's just the existence of uh, the sovereign wealth funds that explains the differential economic performance of a country, a diverse and complex country like Iran, compared to much smaller uh, Gulf shakedoms. Um, I don't think they're beacons of good institutions. They are more reliant on oil, as you said. They're less diversified. Uh, and volatility, as you said, and uh, Val reminded us, is even higher there. This does show, and I don't want to overstate the role or impact of sanctions, this does show an interesting um, counterfactual. Iran, after JCPOA was signed, started growing. In one year, it grew to 12.5%. Of course, it was because lost output, especially in the oil sector, was uh, uh, re regained. Re but it was estimated by both the World Bank and the IMF that Iran's growth post-JCPOA would be reaching four, four and a half, possibly five percent. Now, the IMF uh, stipulates Iran's growth is actual negative territory minus six percent. That's a big hit. That is a big hit. That's $24 billion wiped out from a country whose GDP is around, say, 400 billion. Now, but that's not the real cost. The real cost is 10 percent. Because Iran should have been growing at 4%. It's going down minus 6%. So there's a huge gap in one year alone. This is a big hit. OK, when the time comes for a uh, more stable economic time in Iran, Iran will regain its strength. But it's a long way till then. And I think, as I said, uh, the impact of the sanctions has even surprised Iran. Having said that, I would repeat that I don't think sanctions are the right way to bring back Iran to uh, international diplomacy, not least because when they last time showed they are capable of behaving like international interlocutors, they were really dealt a terrible, terrible lesson. And that's bad for international diplomacy. Yeah. Can I just, but uh, Hassan, Saudi Arabia is a much bigger economy than Iran. Saudi Arabia, in, in, uh, not per capita, but uh, in, in total economy is much bigger. And I think, I mean, a good example is Kuwait. Kuwait actually has, I mean, they don't have stellar institutions, but much better institutions. So after the oil prices increased, what they did was they increased the uh, inflow to the future genera generation fund to 25%. And then afterwards, they brought it back because obviously oil prices dropped. So. But I want to just go back to Paris's point is that, yeah, I mean, these things take a long time to build. I mean, we are talking about uh, investing money in, uh, you know, uh, regions. We're talking about better fiscal policies. We're talking about better monetary policies. I mean, there's so much work to do in the management of the Iranian economy. And I, I, really, I, th I really don't think, and, and, and really the story has been, just because we are under sanctions, we have this external threat, let's not do anything else. And, and we have been saying that for the past 40 years. And really the opportunity to do something is now. I think if policymakers really are thinking, I mean, if you have a five-year window, it's like if you, if you think about people as shareholders, you want to deliver, right? And to deliver, you, th you have to make tough choices. And one of those things, for instance, could be subsidies. Another one would be increased taxation. I mean, these things would change the social contract. They might not be, you know, uh, in the interest of the, of the elite, but it's in the interest of, 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 the, of the country. Sanctions also have unintended consequences, right? 
So one of the positive things about sanctions in the first time around was they led to an increase in petrochemical industry. So this was good news for Iran because the value added is larger, right? So we shouldn't think about the sanctions. Every sector of the economy is hit. Some sectors actually benefit. All right, uh, take another round. Um, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Charles McCallan. I'm a research fellow at King's College London. I'm incoming to the Belfer Center. Thank you very much for your talk. I don't know much about economics. I've learned a lot, and I've been confused a lot uh, today. Um, but more, I've learned more, I think. Um, the question I have is more international relations focused, and it's sort of twofold, and perhaps any or all of you could touch on one or both of them, perhaps. Um, obviously, we have uh, John Bolton's image up here, and we're thinking about, I'll sit down, sorry, to, uh, just in case. You have John Bolton up here and Donald Trump, and there are sort of these policies of withdrawing from the agreement and whatnot that's often attributed to them. Let's just fast forward a couple years, and let's say, let's assume he doesn't get elected. If the Democratic comes in, how, within sort of the foreign policy establishment, that are there on the Democratic side, and even if a successor to Trump on the Republican side, let's say he gets reelected or whatever, the next Republican, how deep is this current of maximum pressure, these sorts of withdrawal from these agreements, or is it really just a symptom of this personality along with Donald Trump or whatnot? I'm just sort of curious your take on that. And secondly, because I'm interested in the military kinetic side of things, uh, shooting down this drone, the things that are going on in the recent weeks, is this a sort of a, is this a last resort issue, this is some of the one thing that Iran can control to an extent in trying to just recalibrate the system in order to get people to the negotiating table like North Korea might do if they're going to do nuclear tests or they're going to do weapon systems. They're just trying to get people to the negotiating table to try to, uh, as I understand it, to try to get sanction relief. Are there other options that you think Iran might turn to now that they came quite close to perhaps getting a kinetic action against them, that they, maybe there are economic options at stake? Uh, that they would think about doing. I don't know if, uh, enough about that, but I'd like to hear your th thoughts. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, yes, in the back. Sorry, making you walk around a lot. <laughs> but up and down. Uh, other questions? Um, hi, I am Mina Joshagani from BBC's Persian service. Um, this is off the record, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to. Um, so Kamyar, um, could you, would, would you uh, be able to give me um, an estimation of your evaluation of how many barrels per day Iran could export oil at this um, current um, status and um, Svandiar, this is for you. As you said that all eyes are on Instex and it's it's not really um, looking great for Europe and if, even if, as, as you said before when uh, John Kerry came over to London, all, all the hopes that were built up after the JCPOA was kind of uh, kind of faded away very quickly uh, with, with the companies not really um, daring to do it because they were they were just scared of the, the uh, U.S. sanctions. Would you think that this this time actually with with Instex that that would work actually, and uh, how how would it work? And one more question for Hassan or any other speakers, um, with the with the drone situation and the um, feud that's the, the tension that's rising recently. Do you see? Um, if U.S. didn't reply with a military action to the drone um, attack, do you see more sanctions coming, and h how would they be? Because Trump said that they would react some way. Thank you. Great, and there's one more here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hello. Um, hello, my name is Nima. Thanks for the talk from the panel. Um, my question is uh, from Hassan. You know, uh, you talked about the sanctions that um, is less effective for regime change, and um, most people believe in that, and I personally believe in that. But um, I think two points is um, um, 
better to be mentioned, and I think it, it significantly affects that. Uh, one is that, that we know that the crude oil, you know, uh, contributes to 15 to like 25 percent of the Iran's economy. And uh, if um, today the, um, the sanctions are lifted or just uh, we stop the sanctions today, we still have the problems, political, um, social problems. Or uh, So my question is that don't you think that uh, this way uh, it is like, uh, if, if it's continued in the long term approach, um, it is like masking, the, masking that people's like anger or a, just like or some people that seeks for their responsibility from the public, from, from the government authorities in Iran. Uh, don't, mm, don't you think this is like uh, disregarding this aspect and, and just like and, and the second thing is that because uh, some maximum pressure significantly affected the lives of the ordinary people so this included also activists and um, um, just uh, that, that civil society groups in Iran so and they, their energy was mostly uh, spent on um, just uh, like uh, making basically uh, ends meet so uh, don't you think that this can negatively affect the whole approach in the, um, in the movement, reform, or regime change, which um, some population in Iran believe in that? Um, great. And I don't think we'll have time for another round of questions. So was there one more here? Uh, sorry, I'll move to the right there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Oh, okay. Well, we're going rever reverse order, yeah. Um, there were a couple of uh, questions specifically uh, pointed to me um, on impact on civil society. Yeah. Uh, I actually believe that in terms of potential for reform and social transformation, Iran with at least a history of four decades of revolutionary experience is better placed to experience the real spring that we've been talking about in the Middle East for quite some time if there's no uh, unfortunate, tragic um, gameplay imposed on, on Iran from outside. And by that I mean, you know, the prospects of uh, military intervention or another what will be obviously seen as uh, external uh, uh, intervention. You will remember that uh, in 1980 with Saddam, when Saddam Hussein attacked Iran, uh, he did the Iranian uh, regime a great service by giving them a perfect uh, opportunity to rally around the population uh, uh, whose expectations for change was, you know, exploding the roof. In, this is this society which has just experienced one of the most mass-based real revolutionary upheavals brought on the strongest henchmen in, 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 in the region. And this was the real opening for civil society, for revolutionary groups, uh, all sorts of uh, workers' councils, trade unions, political parties making, articulating their demands. And with the uh, war imposed from outside, that space got shut down. And we saw a repression set in in the 1980s, especially during those uh, dark years. So I suspect if there's another repetition of this classic mistake of attacking a revolution or a revolutionary uh, uh, society from outside, what you do is you postpone any real prospects for uh, real transformation, social uh, transformation from within. And uh, if that doesn't happen, I believe Iran, based on the experience that learned the hard way in the last 40 years, uh, has the potential for that because we have a very educated uh, workforce, we have a strong, thriving uh, middle class, uh, and we have m in many areas, you know, Iran society is very vibrant, so that potential is there. And unfortunately, this would be another unintended consequence of uh, furthering uh, 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 tensions to the point that uh, we get into military conflict on a colossal scale, of course, this time. Um, the question about regime change or change in behavior. Well, I'm not very uh, optimistic about change in behavior for the reasons that I've pointed out. Uh, Trump, 
Trump's foreign policy seems to hover around this hope or expectation that if you push your foe, your enemy, to the brink, they might blink first. He probably thinks this is what is the right way in North Korea and probably is expecting his uh, uh, Nobel Prize for peace uh, on that front. But for an ideology, in, in the context of an ideological state like Iran, I just cannot see that Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, will behave like Jong-un. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, I, not least because they showed the ability to engage in international diplomacy, they actually uh, showed compromise uh, and signed a deal that was not at the end uh, respected. So the incentive to go, there's a lot of discussion about uh, will Iran go back to the table? The question is, what would be the agenda, short of surrender? What would be the agenda? The U.S. side has clearly stated the agenda would be uh, no sunset, that means on military capability, uh, nuclear capability of Iran, never, that was not part of G JCPOA, uh, free unrestricted inspection of all military sites in Iran. Trump, Trump has tweeted about this. No country on earth, short of signing away their national sovereignty, will agree to that. And then the regional influence of Iran, which uh, we haven't mentioned, and of course this, is, uh, this forms part of the uh, uh, political discussions. Um, this is true. Iran has, I think, uh, played its regional policy very uh, deftly. But in many, whether, whether this is part of an overarching a calculated, premeditated, grand strategy for uh, in, in increasing its influence in the region, the so-called Shia uh, crescent or whatever. I think it's more likely to do with uh, American foreign policy in the region, what they did in Iraq, what they did in Afghanistan. They brought down two of Iran's arch enemies. They didn't quite realize that by default, the beneficiary would be Iran, an Iranian regime. And secondly, and equally importantly, the divisions within the Arab world. Who pushed Qatar towards Iran? It was the quartet led by the, by the Saudis. So I think Iran has, Iran can offer quite a few lessons in foreign policy to MBS and MBZ. If they have ever offer a short course, I, I would recommend they sign up because uh, the Saudis and especially the Saudis on their MBS have uh, just experienced a catalog of foreign policy disasters in the region. You just look around. I mean, the tragic war in Yemen, how they dealt with uh, Lebanon's uh, Hariri, uh, the Qatari case, which I mentioned, and, and you know, so many other cases, and the, the tragic death murder of Khashoggi. So there is very little to show for Saudi Arabia in terms of its own foreign policy when it continues to blame Iran's intentions to expand and to become dominant in the region. I'm not an apologist for Iranian regime. Iran has to be accountable to international norms and standards, both internally and externally. But in order to encourage good behavior, you have to show that you have the ability to uh, behave well and not badly. So I will, um, I'll answer the question about the, the f sort of next administration or the same administration, hopefully the next administration. Um, and then uh, also the question of maybe what comes next in the short term. So I think you raise a really, this is the big dilemma for any Democratic candidate. Most of the major Democratic candidates have come out and said that they support re-entering the JCPOA as a sort of uh, first step before opening new negotiations. I think there's wide uh, acknowledgement in the policy community, left and right in DC, that the negotiations will have to be expanded from their scope. That's not inconsistent with what Tehran intended after the JCPOA was meant to serve as a trust building mechanism. There's always been an intention to talk about regional issues uh, and the ballistic missile program, but f as, as equals, not as a country being dictated to. The problem is that the maximum pressure campaign, I see two issues. One is that the, the f um, mechanism by which the campaign works 
which is the risk perception of commercial actors, has been deeply socialized at this point. You have repeatedly told compliance officers, and it's a whole community of people within uh, financial institutions around the world, that anything that has Iran in the name is a red flag and cannot be touched. And unlearning that is a hugely difficult thing to do, and it's going to take a long time. And it's a, it's, I think it's a risk factor for any administration that wants to open the door again to Iran. The second issue is the threat perception of Iran itself. And I think one of the lessons of the JCPOA that I find most frustrating is that even among those who supported the deal, it was a coalition between two groups. One group that believed that Iran, as any country, can pursue an agenda of reform and improve for the better and become a member of the international community. And another group that basically thought that Iran is a bad country constrained by a good deal. And you see this formulation from a lot of the non-proliferation proponents of the JCPOA. They support the deal, but they support it because they think it's a really good way to constrain Iran as fundamentally a bad country. And I think that's a really problematic um, kind of conception of Iran in the policy community because basically the U.S. ascribes to Iran an inherent moral deficiency that it doesn't ascribe to many countries around the world that it ultimately has to deal with. And that's something that a Democratic candidate is going to have a really hard time uh, getting over, particularly if you think about uh, bringing Congress back into this, which is going to be an important part. Uh, on the drone strikes, just briefly, I'm going to be uh, contrary and maybe a little bit and say that I think that the chance for diplomacy has improved slightly after what's happened the last week. There are two reasons. One is that assuming Iran did the tanker attack, which I think is a fair assumption, um, it helped demonstrate, it helped the Iranians demonstrate the costs for the other countries in the region of a low level set of provocations that Iran can do and that the U.S. is not really willing to step in and prevent. And the greater demonstration of that is that the Iran just shot down a drone, and yesterday Donald Trump had everything in the air to go and do a retaliatory strike and didn't ultimately proceed with it. And I think that helps show that there is such a reticence on the part of the U.S., not just Trump personally, but a lot of figures in the policy establishment. Even Tucker Carlson on Fox News is basically telling Trump, don't get into another war. From a Republican standpoint, it's a risky electoral proposition that it suggests that military confrontation, and this goes back to what might happen next, is not necessarily as available a policy option for the U.S. as we might think. There's actually a lot of things that make that expensive for Trump back in Washington. Um, I think some people would disagree with me on that, but ultimately, if that leads us to an impasse where Iran is showing the regional actors it can make their life difficult, the GCC, uh, and also we know that the U.S. security guarantee is not as robust as we imagined, it seems more likely that a diplomatic set of negotiations is the only available way out of this impasse. The final thing I'll say is one of the reasons why I think that this is a fair interpretation is that a lot of the proponents or a lot of the advocates who pushed Trump out of the JCPOA and really were against the nuclear deal are advocating for him to not escalate but stay with the max pressure campaign. Maximum pressure is working. Don't get into a war. You don't need to do that. Just stay the course. But I think that suggests that they also know that a war is not a reasonable option for them, that it's going to be extremely expensive. Uh, and realistically, as long as max pressure ceases or continues not to show any outcomes, I'm optimistic that there will be some need for talks to take place. But a lot of people around Trump are trying to prevent that from happening. <laughs> so um, I think just on the short run, uh, short term um, issues, I I don't think that the Iranian economy is Iranian economy is going to perform terribly as compared to other uh, uh, counterparts, so other oil exporters. Uh, growth in Iran is going to be somewhere close to zero, plus minus one maybe in the next f in the next five years, uh, which is obviously tolerable 
because it's not a negative growth. We're not seeing a sustained 6% drop in, in, in GDP. The problem is, it's going the distribution, the, the way people are going to be hit is going to be that the people, I mean, really is the vulnerable people that will be hit disproportionately. So in a way, the sanctions for the aggregate economy, it's, does, it's plus minus one. And 1% 1 growth, to be honest, in today's world is, is quite a lot. Not for an oil exporter, um, but uh, is sustainable. Uh, but but the, it's, the, it's the most vulnerable people that will suffer the most. So I, I mean, I don't think in the next, next five years the Iranian economy is not going to crumble. That's the, uh, that I, I, from my point of view. And I don't think we will have these wild exchange rate movements that we've had, the, the uh, depreciation of the currency, because they're really auto-correcting for what the fundamentals are. It's not, it's not that uh, another round of sanction is going to trigger a 70% uh, uh, depreciation of the currency. I, I really don't believe that. Um, and on the oil side, I think I, I, I was, uh, when the sanctions were introduced, and I, I do think, I don't think multilateral, it makes much difference because financial sanctions, secondary sanction, is like a multilateral sanction, right? Even though it's a unilaterally imposed, you kind of restrict other people from trading with Iran and, and dealing with Iran. And um, even back then I said, uh, this was a year ago, I said Iran's going to export one million barrel a day re regardless, and I think that's still going to be the case. This zero, bringing Iran's oil exports to zero, is A, unrealistic, and B, I don't think it's desirable for the administration because it would t take off quite a lot of oil in a quite tight, in in the market is very tight. And uh, it would be conflicting with Trump policy of having low uh, petrol, uh, low gas prices in the United States. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks so much. Thanks for starting your weekend with us. And uh, uh, join me in thanking our speakers again. Thank you.